start by thanking Anna for introducing me, and I'm actually really impressed by how many people are here, so thanks everybody for coming. Um, Anna said I was going to talk about my research, and that's what I'm about to do, and I want to mention that there are a couple boot karates in the group, so way in the back is Brian Patton, and up closer is Christine, and I think that might be, oh, Nathan is over there also. <laughs> Um, anyway, so DEMA does a lot of projects. Um, some of it is more fundamental physics and some of it is more practical. Um, and I'm going to talk to you today about the fundamental physics side of it. Uh, the talk is called Through the Looking Glass. Um, that's sort of a, that's a, uh, who's the author of? Um, the Lewis Carroll. Carroll. Like, <laughs> the Lewis Carroll reference, right? But there's not going to be any like Jabberwockies or anything in my talk. It's going to be pretty boring comparatively. Uh, so we're going to be focusing on parity violation, and um, parity is uh, conserved quantity associated with mirror reflection. Um, and you know we don't see Jabberwockies, but we do see something. So the question is, what is that thing? Um, I'm so currently this author list. I, I just went back and forth a little bit. I, um, so I'm Dimitri. Jim Tang is an undergraduate who is in my lab right now, and Dima is my advisor. There are a lot of other people who worked on this uh, project and contributed to the results, and I'll mention them by name at the end. Uh, also, NSF pays me. <clears throat> so to motivate the talk today, um, I have this wonderful photograph of a neutron star. I'm just kidding, it's a drawing. Um, <laughs> uh, and I wanted to mention that atomic parity violation is a pretty cool type of experiment because it lets you probe high energy physics using low energy systems. So, you know, Jim and I are in the lab, we have a vacuum chamber and some vacuum pumps, and we get results that are complementary to results that are coming out of CERN um, or SLAC, right? These are the high energy colliders. And we also get results that are of interest to nuclear physicists, and in particular, nuclear astrophysicists studying neutron stars. Uh, this graph, oh, I have a pointer somewhere in my pocket. Uh, this graph here, it's not a graph, it's just a drawing, but um, so there's energy on one axis and precision on the other axis. Um, the trade-off for doing low energy tests of say the standard model or um, probing the nuclear is, is that we have to do really high precision measurements. So um, atomic parity violation is uh, is sort of like a, a tour, tour de force, can I say that? It's like a, it requires a, a careful attention to systematics and bias and all that kind of stuff. Um, and I will tell you hopefully more about both aspects, the um, standard model aspect of this and also the precision aspect. The plan for the talk um, is to present this in four parts. The first part, we're gonna talk a little bit about symmetry and conservation laws. Um, and then I'll talk about what parity violation is. I'm gonna do a pretty brief overview of parity violation that's limited to what I'm doing in my experiment. Um, and then we'll talk about the implications that parity violation has for um, high energy physics. And again, there are standard model tests and probes of the nucleus. Um, and then I'll, I'll, I'll uh, wrap up by talking specifically about my project in Ethereum. So the first part is symmetry and conservation laws. This is a picture of Emmy Nerther, who um, is responsible for a pretty awesome result called Nerther's theorem, um, which connects symmetries to uh, conserved quantities. Um, so symmetry is related to a number of things, and, and it's also related to geometrical transformations. Um, and there are three types of geometric transformation. One is translation. So here there's just some object, and then to the right is the object is translated, right? Like I move this cup of water. Um, another type of geometric trans transformation you pick is rotation. I'm not going to rotate the cup because I don't want to spill the water. And uh, and then the bread, or butter, bread and butter of my research is inversion. So um, you take an object and you can invert it spatially. It's like a mirror reflection. So these are the three um, spatial inversions, and each of them is associated um, to a uh, conserved quantity. So Noether's theorem tells us that uh, there's basically a one-to-one -one correlation between symmetries and conservation laws. 
So in the case of translational symmetry, um, we see that linear momentum is conserved. So what does that mean that something is translationally symmetric? Uh, this is a pretty fundamental statement, and basically it means that the laws of physics are the same over here as they are over there. Uh, without that assumption that the laws of physics are translationally symmetric, we'd have a really hard time doing physics anywhere except for outside of our labs. Um, and so the idea here is that for this coffee cup, right, if, if, or if there weren't friction, I could just tap this coffee cup and it would keep moving across the table um, in a straight line at the same speed. Um, because momentum is conserved. Um, and this is due to the fact that the potential energy of the coffee cup is translationally symmetric. That means the coffee cup has the same potential here as it does here, right? The potential energy only depends on how high it is above the ground. On the other hand, the potential energy of the coffee cup down here is different from what it is up here, right? If I let it go, it's clearly going to change its momentum. The reason for that is that potential energy is not symmetric in the z, in the z direction, right? Um, it depends linearly on the distance above the ground. So in that case, um, we see an example of external fields breaking symmetry. Um, in this case, the gravitational field, which points in the z direction, breaks translational symmetry in the z direction, and we don't see conservation of momentum there. <clears throat> so similarly, we have uh, rotational symmetry, which means you could have a system whose energy, um, or actually in this case, the Lagrange, doesn't depend on angle. And in that case, you get conservation of angular momentum. And what we're going to talk about today is um, systems that are asymmetric, actually, under um, spatial inversion. And the conserved quantity associated with systems that are symmetric under inversion is parity. And we'll talk a little bit about, more about parity in a second. Um, oh, actually, let's go up one to talk more about parity. Parity is different from the other, or spatial inversion is different from the other types of geometric transformations in that it is discrete. So, and by discrete, I mean that you have a left-handed system, this is my right hand, and a right-handed system, um, but you don't have anything in between. So, for instance, um, compare this to rotation. I can rotate this object through any angle theta, a small one or a big one or anything in, in between, but I can't perform an intermediate reflection, right? It's either reflected or it isn't. And so the, this difference shows up in the conserved quantity parity um, because parity can only take on one of two values. And we often call these, pop, these values left and right, one or minus one, even or odd, right? So if you think about sines and cosines, these are often called even or odd functions. That refers to their parity. Um, and that's different from, say, rotation or, or angular momentum or linear momentum, which can take on continuous values. So parity is already different from the other types of symmetries in that it's discrete. <clears throat> so one question we might ask is, how do we test whether or not a system is rotationally symmetric? Um, and the easiest test we can do is build an experiment we have two copies of the same experiment. So now this object here no longer represents just you know, carving out of wood. It's actually um, an experimental apparatus. There's a bunch of crap in there, um, electronics and lasers and stuff like that. Um, and we build two versions of that experiment, but one is rotated with respect to the other one by an angle theta. And in a world where we expect rotational symmetry, we also expect that our red and blue scientists here get the same results. The problem is their labs are probably on Earth, and they're probably doing their experiments on Earth. And Earth is a very heavy magnet. Um, and just like gravity spoils translational symmetry, right? So that energy of this coffee cup is not, or sorry, momentum of the coffee cup is not conserved in the Z direction, um, it's also going to spoil rotational symmetry. So um, for instance, the gravitational magnetic fields of the Earth here, uh, I forgot I just played a pointer. Uh, the gravitational magnetic fields of the Earth are um, aligned with one axis of this experiment, but they're no longer aligned in the rotated frame, or in the rotated experiment. <clears throat> and so in this case, um, the red scientist experiment isn't a true rotation of the blue scientist experiment. So the obvious solution is to travel to outer space, perform these experiments there, far away from external gravitational magnetic fields, um, and what these two scientists would find is the very happy result that um, 
they both see the same thing, which means that the universe is rotational symmetric, or at least their experiments are, and angular momentum is therefore conserved. Um, you could go through the same line of reasoning for uh, a test for parity conservation, or um, analogously, or equivalently, uh, inversion symmetry. But what you'd find is that the scientists don't get the same result, right? So in this case, we have one experiment, and then we have a second experiment that is an exact replica, except that it is a mirror image. And the two scientists get different results. And this is because the universe is asymmetric under a spatial inversion, and parity is not conserved. So this is what we mean by parity violation. <clears throat> um, so that's, that's the end of the first section where we're talking about symmetry and transformations. Um, and now what I'd like to talk about is what does parity violation look like in an atomic system? Um, and here we have a picture of um, Marie Bouchia. And Bouchia is um, pretty famous for, in, in the field of atomic parity violation, for contributions um, to both experiment and theory. Um, so uh, you'll see some papers cited here. Uh, she's, she and Zeldovich basically kicked this field um, into existence. We don't have two versions of the same experiment downstairs in my lab. And my lab is downstairs, not in outer space. So, so how are we doing a comparison between a left-handed experiment and a right-handed experiment? Um, the first thing we do is we put a lot of external magnetic field coils to cancel out Earth's magnetic field. We design an experiment that, doesn't, that isn't sensitive to gravitational effects. Um, so we don't have to worry that much about the fact that the Earth is a very heavy magnet. We can, we can cancel out the effects of the Earth's magnetic, or magnetic and gravitational fields. Um, we still have the problem that we need two experiments. The way we do this is, um, it's an atomic physics experiment, so we're shining laser on an atom. This is a very small laser and a very big atom here. Um, and we do that in the presence of an external electric field and magnetic field. Here this script E is the electric field of the light. So um, this light itself has its own electric field. And we use these three external fields to create a handedness for our experiment. Um, so I can switch now from a right-handed experiment to a left-handed experiment, right? I can do my experiment and its mirror image if I change the direction of any of these fields. Um, this is often referred to as field reversal. Um, and by doing so, right, my experiment, which is pretty simple, I'm just, I'm literally shining a purple light on an atom and it's fluorescing green. This is this green ha halo here. Um, and by doing that, um, if the universe is spatially symmetric, or symmetric under uh, spatial inversion and parity is conserved, I wouldn't see any difference. But when I do that and I switch from a right-handed to a left-handed system, I see a change in the fluorescence of the atom. Um, and this is the end of my talk, because now we know what atoms look like on the other side of the mirror. They're a little bit dimmer. <laughs> but, uh, this change is really, really small. It's like 10 parts per million. Um, and like I said in the beginning, atomic parity violation experiments are high-precision experiments. We're looking for really small signals here, and 10 parts per million is a very small signal. Um, but this is the gist of what I do in the lab. I reverse an electric field and I measure the fluorescence of this atom and I see that it <coughs> changes brightness by 10 parts per million. Um, and I do this over and over again so I can get good statistics. So there are two questions. One question is why am I doing this? Uh, we'll get to the motivation in a little bit. And the other question is why, why does this happen? Why is the universe asymmetric under spatial inversion. Why does my experiment and why do my experiment and its mirror image give different results? The culprit here is the weak interaction. Um, so you might know that there are four fundamental forces in physics. There's gravity, um, electromagnetism, the weak nuclear force, and the strong nuclear force. Of those four, the only interaction that violates parity is the weak interaction. Um, and we can think, uh, and so the way it manifests in atom, it, atoms is the electrons are interacting with the nucleus via the weak interaction in a way that's analogous to their interaction with the nucleus electrically. 
So, um, right, you have protons and you have electrons, they have electric charge and they attract each other. Um, in the quantum mechanical picture, we think not, we don't talk about forces anymore, but virtual particle exchange. So we can think of the protons and the electrons um, exchanging virtual photons. And this is the analog of force. And so for people who haven't heard that analogy, it might just um, take one second to explain a little bit. What's your name? Me? Yeah. Rylan. Rylan? Mm -hmm. So me and Rylan are two electrons. We are going to repel each other. The way we're going to do it is I'm going to throw a snowball at him, and he's going to, well, if it's a snowball, I guess it's just going to land on you. <laughs> Um, and when I do that, I give momentum to the snowball, and, tr and I recoil back, he catches it, and he recoils back a little bit. If I keep throwing snowballs at Ryland, the two of us eventually are going to repel each other. So this is the idea of virtual particle exchange. Um, explaining attraction is a little bit different, but you can imagine we're facing opposite directions, and I throw a boomerang, I go this way, it comes around, he catches it, and he comes with me. Um, so the analog of the Coulomb interaction, or the Coulomb force in quantum mechanics, is photon exchange. The electrons are exchanging photons with the nucleons, so this energy is nucleon. <clears throat> this is the electromagnetic force. It conserves parity. It doesn't change. The electromagnetic interactions don't change under spatial inversion. The electroweak force, by analogy, is the electrons exchanging now a Z0 boson instead of a photon with the nucleons. Um, and just like we can talk about the, the electric charge of the nucleus, which basically scales like the number of protons, we can talk about the weak charge of the nucleus, which scales roughly like the number of neutrons. <clears throat> the, the main difference, there are two big differences between these. This is a long range and this is short range force, but that's a little bit less important. The main difference is that this is a parity conserving interaction, this is parity violating. Um, but again, the, this is a very small effect, right? The electroweak effect is very small compared to the electromagnetic. If you look at the amplitude, the relative amplitude for this interaction compared to this interaction, um, it's a very small number, about 10 parts per billion, but it scales like the weak charge, oops, the weak charge times the electric charge squared. Um, and because of, in, a, in heavy atoms, the number of neutrons is roughly equal to the number of protons, so Q scaled roughly like Z. Um, this is often called the Z cubed scaling law. Um, so the ratio of, this, of these interactions scales roughly like the number of protons in the nucleus. And for this reason, atomic parity violation experiments typically focus on heavy atoms. So I use a terbium in my experiment, um, which has seven neutrons. Uh, this still doesn't answer the question, right? I mean, how does this interaction give rise to a change in fluorescence? Um, and this, fortunately or not, will probably be the most math we see um, in my talk. Uh, so here what I have is the same picture. This is, this is this picture, but in an energy level diagram. So the atom now is represented by these energy levels. Um, the incoming purple light is represented by this arrow here. And the fluorescent green light is represented by this squiggly line here. Uh, so what's happening is I'm shining the purple light on an atom, and the atom absorbs some of that purple light, and we say that it gets excited. So it goes from its ground state to its excited state. Um, and when it's in that excited state, it decays by emitting a green photon. So this is basically the picture we're drawing here. Um, for those of you who have taken a quantum class and you've talked about things like selection rules, um, I want to mention that uh, one of the selection rules for atomic transition is that an electric dipole transition from an initial state with even parity to a final state of the same parity is strictly forbidden. They're for, for, forbidden by asymmetry rules. Um, but what happens here is because we have the electroweak interaction, right, that's just, um, this final state actually gets mixed a little bit with a nearby opposite parity state. What this really means is that Parity is no longer a good quantum number, so it's wrong for us to think of this final state as having an intrinsic parity. And because of this admixture, there's a very small amplitude due to the weak electroweak interactions for this transition to occur. This is what I'm going to call an AW here. So AW is the probability amplitude for this um, normally forbidden transition. Uh, remember that we're doing this in the presence of external electric magnetic fields. The electric field also mixes these states by a parity-conserving process called the Stark effect. 
Um, I won't go into those details, but we can, we can amplify that admixture and we get what's called a stark induced transition amplitude. That's as beta E. So E here symbolizes that, that the stark induced transition scales like the electric field. If the electric field is zero, so there isn't one, so too is the amplitude. Um, and beta here is a coefficient just to make the units work out here. Uh, in quantum mechanics, we talk about amplitudes and we talk about probabilities. And probabilities are, are always the square of the sum of the amplitudes. Um, so here, they're summed and then squared. And what we see is that there's a cross term. There's this large parity conserving term due to the Stark interaction, scales like the electric field squared. And then there's a smaller term. Uh, it's an interference term that scales linearly in the electric field and also linearly in the weak interaction. There's another term here that scales like AW squared. It's very small, so we ignore it. It's basically zero. Um, now we can see why this term, this interference term, is parity violating. Uh, if I change the sign of the electric field, I change the sign of the interference term. The parity conserving uh, term stays the same, right? Because it scales like E squared. And in so far as the fluorescence, right, the probability of emitting a photon is proportional to the probability of absorbing a photon, I'll see a small change in the fluorescence as well. Um, so this effect is called the Stark interference effect. I told you you'd see Bouchia's name popping up. Uh, Bouchia and Bouchia both wrote this. She co-wrote that paper with her husband. Um, and uh, this is basically, this is basically the, the scheme that has been used to achieve the most precise measurements of atomic parity violation. Um, and it's called the Stark interference technique. And it's characterized by something called the asymmetry. The asymmetry is um, the fractional change of fluorescence upon a reversal of the electric field. Um, so it's basically looked like this piece divided by this piece. Um, and this is the asymmetry. Uh, and this is the quantity that we measure in the lab. And this is the thing that's about 10 parts per million. This is, this is the small thing that we measure. So that is it for an overview of parity violation. Like I said, um, parity violation in general is a very rich field. Um, there's a lot of activity going on in high energy colliders and also nuclear physics. Um, and this is also even just a small subset of atomic parity violation experiments. So it will be enough for today. Um, the question is why, why reverse the electric field over and over and over again and measure this 10 parts per million um, change very precisely, right? What's, why did I spend five years of my life doing this? <laughs> Um, and like I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, there are two main implications. One is that uh, atomic parity violation measurements are low energy complements to high energy tests of the standard model. Um, by measuring the asymmetry, we can actually extract measurements of the weak nuclear charge, and we can use that to place constraints on new, new physics. Um, the second main goal is probing the nucleus um, using atomic physics. Um, and we can probe the, the nucleus in two major ways. One is by measuring neutron distributions, and another way is by measuring the nuclear anifold model. I'll talk more about these things in, um, right now, I guess. Uh, so this graph is going to be a little bit challenging to explain, so bear with me. Um, I, I, I mentioned that we can measure the weak charge of the nucleus with atomic parity violation experiments. Um, earlier I told you the weak charge is roughly equal to the number of neutrons. There's also this second contribution here. Um, Z again is the number of protons. Theta W is uh, a parameter in the standard model. It's um, related, it pops out of like symmetry breaking where you get like electroweak unification and then you can break that into the weak, weak interaction and the electromagnetic interaction. Um, it's also uh, Theta W is also related to the relative mass of the weak gauge boson. So in addition to the Z0 boson that I talked about earlier, there's something called the W plus minus. In any case, um, Theta W is an important parameter in the standard model. And by measuring Q, I, can, I know how many neutrons and I know how many protons are in the terbium number, uh, nucleus. I can effectively measure sine squared of Theta W. So Theta W is called the Weinberg angle. It's sometimes called the weak mixing angle. Um, and here, so the most, precise, um, the most precise measurement to date of atomic parity violation has been performed in cesium. So from the measurement of the weak charge of the cesium nucleus, we can extract a measurement of sine squared theta w, and here it is in red. 
And this axis here is called the momentum transfer. It's a measure of the energies involved in these experiments. Uh, atomic physics are like mega electron volts. So they're sitting out here at the very low end of the energy scale. Um, what the black bar, what the black line here is, is a theoretical prediction um, of how sine squared theta w depends <coughs> on the energy, uh, the momentum transfer involved in the um, Plots like this um, in higher energy physics are typically called uh, runnings. So this is the running of the weak mixing angle. And the black line is a theoretical prediction. The gray band here is the uncertainty in the theoretical prediction. And so you can see that the cesium measurement agrees very well with um, the value predicted by the standard model. There are three other points up here. I wish there were only two. I don't like talking about this one. <laughs> only because it, it has a big error bar, but also I don't really know uh, if there have been updates on it. E158, this is coming out of SLAPS and Stanford Linear Accelerator. Um, they performed some measurement from which they could extract sine squared theta w. This is some high energy PDG is particle data group. Um, so these are uh, people over in Europe that are um, doing some measurement. This has very small air, enter, uh, error bars because it's performed near the mass of the Z0 boson. In any case, uh, what you can see from here, the important things to extract are that the atomic parity violation measurement agrees very well with theory. Um, and that here it lives on a graph where all the other data points come from high energy experiments, right? Whether they're from SLAC or CERN. Um, part of the whole data groups at CERN, yeah. So, so I guess the point I want to make here is that not only can we test predictions with the standard model, but we do so in a way that's complementary to high energy searches for tests of the standard model. Um, then there are two nuclear properties we can probe. One is called the nuclear anapole moment. Um, this drawing is also going to be, these next few slides are all going to be difficult to interpret. <laughs> this drawing here is a drawing of the nuclear anapole moment. It's a, so the nuclear anapole moment is an electromagnetic moment of the nucleus. So nuclei have magnetic dipole moments. They're basically little bar magnets. Um, in addition to that, they have something called an anapole moment. I don't know how to think of that classically. Um, but it's a vector, and it's a vector property of the nucleus. Um, and it arises due to weak interactions of nucleons with each other. So not only are the, inter are the electrons interacting with the, nuclei, uh, the neutrons in the nucleus via uh, the weak interaction, but the protons and neutrons in the nucleus are interacting with each other weakly. And those interactions give rise to um, this toroidal magnetic field. So B here is the magnetic field, and it exists everywhere within this torus. And there's some charge here that's flowing radially out to give rise to this magnetic field. So there's some, there's some um, non-zero current within the nucleus. Um, and the thing to notice here is that the magnetic field is totally localized within the nucleus of the atom. So um, only, only electrons that are in their s orbitals can actually interact with this magnetic field. But when they interact with the magnetic field, they do so electromagnetically. So the way that the anapole moment shows up in parity violation experiments is as a small correction to the regular parity violating signal we're measuring in the first place. And it arises because the electrons are interacting electromagnetically with this magnetic field that arises due to parity violating interactions within the nucleus. Within the nucleus. Um, it's a little bit esoteric, I think. But uh, it's cool. And the reason, the reason that we are interested in measuring it right now is because it's been measured twice before. It's been measured in cesium and it's been measured in cesium. <coughs> neither of those measurements agree with theory. Well, I mean theory. I mean neither of those measurements agree with other nuclear physics measurements of the same parameter. And they also don't agree with each other. So the question is, is there a problem with the experiment? Is there a problem with an interpretation in the measurement? Or is there an, a problem with uh, what the theorists are doing? Um, it's an open question. Uh, Ytterbium is a great candidate for measuring the nuclear anapole moment, providing a third data point that either further complicates the interpretation of all this data or hopefully resolves, resolves these open questions. Um, the second property of the nucleus I think is a bit more interesting is something called the neutron skin. Um, 
So if you think about the nucleus as being made up of neutrons and protons, um, you can think of them as like clouds, right? In quantum mechanics, everything gets a little bit blurry, so there's a proton cloud and a neutron cloud in the nucleus, um, and each of those clouds is characterized by a, a radius, and the radius of the proton cloud and the radius of the neutron cloud are different. And the difference in those radii is called the neutron skin. So here we have a very non-blurry picture. Um, it was made by a fantastic artist. Um, <laughs> and you can see that the neutron radius and the proton radius are different. And so this quantity here, the difference in those radii, is called the neutron skin. Uh, it has, to my knowledge, never been measured before. Um, and the reason it's never been measured before is because it's really hard to measure um, neutron distributions. Um, proton distributions are really easy to measure. You just launch other protons at them or you launch electrons at them. And because they interact electromagnetically, either the protons will deflect like this or the electrons will deflect like this. And based on the deflection angles, you can infer um, the size of the cloud of protons. Neutrons are neutral. They don't deflect anything. They suck, right? They're really hard to measure. Um, fortunately, parity violation measurements um, are sensitive to the neutron skin. Um, I say fortunately now, but a long time ago, people actually thought that the neutron skin contributed to the measurements in a such a way as to make them impossible to interpret. We never measured it before. How do we know to subtract out their contributions? Um, and it turns out if you're looking at a single isotope, it doesn't matter. But if you look at measurements in a chain of isotopes, um, the effects of the neutron scan actually become very important because in different neutrons, you have, or different isotopes, right, the thing that's changing is the number of neutrons, and so the neutron distribution is also going to change. And so it turns out that the way the, new, the, um, the way that the neutron skin changes with the number of neutrons in the nucleus is an interesting thing. So we know how the weak charge depends on the number of neutrons in the nucleus. It's linear, right? So if we measure the parity violating asymmetry in different isotopes of the same atom, uh, we, know, we know what the weak charge contribution is, and the rest is going to be due to details of the neutron skin. So we can actually use parity violation measurements in chains of isotopes to measure the neutron skin, something that has never been measured before. There's an ongoing experiment in Virginia that's going to try to measure the neutron skin in lead by doing what? Accelerating a proton beam and smashing it into a lead. Right. So again, atomic parity violations are comparable to high energy or er, complements high energy experiments. Is there a simple way to understand why the neutron radius is larger? There may be, but I don't know. Okay. <laughs> yeah, this my guess would be that um, some of the rest energy for a proton gets lost in the EMP. I'm not going to argue with that. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, so I, I've mentioned a few times, oh, I didn't even point out, there's one slide where there's a big chunk of metal down here. That was a turkey. I'm going to show it to you guys. Um, <laughs> uh, my experiment is uh, focusing on a turkey, and that's it. This is what it looks like. It's kind of soft. Sometimes I have to chisel it off with crap. Mm -hmm. um, a turkey. It's YD. Um, so this is what it looks like. Um, I have it in a plastic bag. <laughs> uh, why, why are we using a terbium? I, I mentioned once that a terbium is heavy, it has 70 protons, so, and we know that uh, the asymmetry scales like Z cubed, so that's one, that's one mark in, in its favor. Um, I said also that we could use it to measure the anapole moment, um, <coughs> the second mark in its favor. Uh, but it also has a lot of stable nuclei. So cesium, I don't think has any stable, or sorry, I don't think cesium has any stable isotopes besides the one. But a terbium has a lot. And here are the five um, most abundant, even neutron number isotopes. Because if you're looking for the neutron scan, you're looking at even isotopes. Um, and so there are five of them. And what this is a plot of is um, the neutron skin, this is according to some theoretical model as a function of neutron number. Each line here corresponds to a different atom, I think starting at tin. So this one on the very left is tin. Um, and here, ytterbium is the fattest line. Um, ytterbium has five even isotopes that can be used to measure the neutron skin. So 
So we can look at this chain. So this is another mark in favor of looking at a term. It has a lot of isolation. Um, and so that, with that, I want to transition into the actual experiment that I'm doing in Intermium. And how much time do I have? Um, here's this fancy picture of a terbium again. Uh, typically, when you're look at an atomic physics talk, this will probably be like among the first slides. I dumped it all the way to the end because it's kind of ugly. <laughs> um, but this is an energy level diagram of your terbium. Um, in the beginning of the talk, when we were talking about the Stark interference method, I showed a picture that basically had the ground state, the excited state, and this opposite parity, nearly degenerate state, and this squiggly line was coming out of here and spread out of here. Um, but essentially, this is the same picture as we saw earlier. Um, this is the energy levels di uh, an energy level diagram of terbium. Uh, the purple light that we use is actually at 408 nanometers. Um, we're driving what's called a singlet S0 to triplet D1 transition. Um, and once the terbium atoms have absorbed the purple light, they can actually decay along two paths. Uh, one path is to this intermediate triplet P1 state. This O here means odd parity. So everything in the odd parity column has a little O over here. Um, and then from the triplet P1 state, they'll decay back to the ground state by emitting 556 nanometer green light. Um, so this, is, this 556 nanometer fluorescence is a fluorescence that we observe. <clears throat> There's a second decay channel from the excited state, and that is down to this triplet P0 metastable state. The reason it's metastable is because J equals zero to J equals zero transitions are highly forbidden. Um, this is another consequence of these selection rules. This is an angular momentum selection rule in this case. Um, and so the, some atoms will absorb purple light and then emit green light, and other atoms will absorb purple light and they'll end up in the metastable state, and then they'll just stay excited. Um, and so what we do is later um, in the experiment, we actually probe the population of the metastable state by shining the 649 nanometer light on the, on the atomium atoms. And so the atoms that are in the metastable state will be excited to this highly excited triplet S1 state, and from there they'll decay back to the ground state by uh, cascade decay, or they'll just decay just straight back down to the triplet P0, and we measure the fluorescence of that and we also use that to measure um, uh, parity violation. In fact, this, the, the population of the metastable state is the signal I use for data analysis. And there are two reasons. One of the reasons is that whereas only about 30% of the atoms decay to the intermediate state and then emit green light, about 60% of the atoms decay to the metastable state. So there are just more atoms that undergo that transition. This is my experimental apparatus. Um, all of this is inside of a vacuum chamber, uh, pumped down to about 10 to minus 6 tor, uh, except for the photomultiplier tube and the photodiode. Those are outside of the vacuum chamber. Um, I have an oven. This is where I load the atomium, and then I heat the oven up to about 500 degrees C, and I create a beam of atoms. So it's like a pop can with a hole poked, poked in the end. You heat up the atoms, we create a vapor, and then they shoot out the end. Um, and so I have this nice beam of a terbium atom that travels downstream. This region here is called the interaction region. Um, this is where the atom gets illuminated by the 408 nanometer light. And in this region, I have these gold electric field plates that are like big capacitors. Um, so there's an electric field. These black things are magnetic field coils that generate a magnetic field. Um, and so here the atoms undergo the parity violating 408 nanometer transition and some of them emit green light right away. The green light that's emitted up gets transported to the photomultiplier tube through this light guide. It's just a piece of plastic. Um, uh, and then some of the, and then uh, atoms travel downstream. Some of the atoms, remember, don't emit green light right away. In fact, they, or instead they decay to the metastable state and those atoms will be excited to the metastable state here. They'll still be excited, still be excited until they come downstream where I'm uh, probing them, probing the population of the metastable state with the 649 nanometer light. So those atoms will absorb the 649 nanometer light and then they'll emit light right away, so they'll fluoresce it here. And the nice thing is, um, sort of this clear dash line I've drawn so that you can see what's going on inside. Up here is a spherical mirror, down here is a parabolic mirror. And if you just do some regular ray optics, um, you can see that you get 
almost all of the fluorescent light, no matter what direction it's emitted, ultimately gets straight up the light guide into the photodiode. So this is the other reason that we use um, the population of the metastable state to measure our signal um, instead of the 556 nanometer fluorescence. And that's because there's a bunch of crap right here. So, I mean, in principle, um, there's some, I mean, it's dipole radiation, but uh, in principle, the green light is getting emitted in any old direction, right? It's not necessarily getting emitted up, but I can only collect the light that's getting emitted straight up. So I'm losing a lot of signal here. In this case, in what we call the detection region, I can optimize the detection conditions, so I can collect a lot of the emitted light. Um, so in addition to having more atoms decaying on this channel, I also have better collection efficiency. So this is why we use this signal um, to measure uh, parity violation. Here again are the directions of the electric field, magnetic field this way, and the laser light polarization. So, uh, you know, you reverse the electric field back and forth a lot, and you do this a lot of times, and this is our main result. So this is a measure of the asymmetry. Um, and here there's a dashed line at zero. So if the asymmetry were zero, we would conclude that you know, the universe is spatially symmetric, or in symmetric under spatial inversion, and uh, parity is conserved. But in fact, our measurement is non-zero. Um, so this light purple band is a theoretical prediction. The dark purple band is the 68% confidence interval for our measurement, and the, and the yellow line is the average value. Um, all of these data points re represent different runs. In total, this is about 70 hours worth of data collection. Um, and uh, so the important things to notice here are that the measurement is non-zero, so we're definitely observing parity violation, and two, that we agree with uh, theoretical prediction, um, which is good on the one hand, but it would have been more exciting if it didn't exist on the other hand. Um, and our final measurement here, uh, the asymmetry measure is about 40 millivolts per centimeter. Um, this parity violation is a precision measurement. Um, so really the thing that we're most interested in is the error bar. We want to make them very small. So here's an uncertainty budget. Um, Statistical uncertainty, you can improve just by collecting more data. Systematic uncertainty is uncertainty that doesn't go away on averaging. So there can be some sources of bias that contribute to your measurement, um, and you have to figure out a way to eliminate those sources of bias. I'm gonna call this guy out because this is Jim Tang. <laughs> he's, he's on the ground of my life. I don't mean to embarrass him, but um, uh, I just want to point him out. <laughs> uh, so there are a couple sources of bias in our experiment. Um, so one is uncertainty in knowing what actually is the electric field we're applying. Um, and if you come back here and you look, these error bars here are much bigger than these error bars here. And the reason is that back in the day, we were using a giant trash can that had been converted into a high voltage power supply to generate the electric field. Um, and so we collected a lot of data, we did some uncertainty analysis, and we recognized that um, fluctuations in the electric field were contributing, were dominating basically our uncertainty. So uh, we spent uh, like 5000 or $10,000 or something ridiculous, it must be like $5,000 on uh, uh, high precision, um, commercial uh, high voltage amplifier and our air drop bars dropped a little bit. Um, but still, the uncertainty in electric field value contributes to our uncertainty. Um, the other main contri uh, contributor is stray fields. And this goes back to that um, really pretty slide in the field with clouds and stuff, right? External fields spoil um, geometrical transformations. And that's you know, we, we have some magnetic field coils to cancel out Earth's magnetic field, but that cancellation is imperfect. There can also be like stray charge buildup on surfaces near the interaction region that contribute to local electric fields. All of these things spoil the transformations. And so they contribute also to our measurement. And uh, we have to measure these stray fields very well and subtract their contribution from what we're doing. Alternatively, we can work really hard to suppress sources of stray fields, uh, but you can never suppress them to zero. Um, 
And so at the end of the day, um, our measurement is um, at the 12% level. In order for us to start looking for the neutron skin, we need to increase this by, or improve this by a factor of 10. We'd be looking at parity violation and asymmetry at the 1% level. Um, and then way down the road there is the ample moment, which is at the 0.1% level, so 100 times better than this. And that's it. I'm done. This is my research group. Hold on. This is okay. This is Dima, this is me, this is Nathan, he's in the back over there. Um, and then there are a bunch of people, Jim who walked in um, just a little bit late, he's right here. Um, basically all the people who worked on the interview experiment are not in this picture. But, <laughs> so it's, it's probably a bad group picture to use. Cluster Tsugukim was a postdoc um, who worked with me on all this work. Um, Pasha was an undergrad from Caltech who worked on this two summers as a surf student, and Afru's family was an undergrad who worked uh, on the project for a long time and has since graduated Berkeley and is now uh, getting a master's um, elsewhere. And then there are a bunch of people in the Budka group who are also in Compass, so that's Nathan in the back over there, Rui, Christine, who's over there, um, and two students who have graduated, TJ Santos and Jeff. And um, so thanks.